thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, you will be glad to hear I brought a surprise guest. Now, who is this guest, you may wonder. Um, I think if the AV is working, he should be right here. I didn't bring him in person. I asked him to record a message for you all, and it should be here any moment now. Hello. My name is uh, Erik Christoffersen. I am the commander of the Norwegian Home Guard. Uh, the Norwegian Home Guard was established in uh, 1946 after World War II. The attack on Norway on April 9, 1940 caught Norway by surprise. And after the war, it was decided to establish a force uh, with the citizen soldiers that could react to unpredictable ev events. Norway decided that we should never be caught by surprise again. The concept of the Home Guard is unique in a way that we have uh, 40,000 soldiers spread all over Norway with a local territorial responsibility. The Home Guard uh, is able to react to unexpected events and they also know their, their situation in the normal days in their uh, counties. Our Home Guard can be used in times of peace, in crisis and in war. Our soldiers are first and foremost infantrymen, uh, which can also support uh, civilian society in case of emergencies. The concept is unique because uh, our soldiers live in the local area. They have a civil competence as well as uh, good military training. That ensures that Norway will never again be attacked by surprise. Thank you. Now, Erik Christoffersen is one of Norway's best officers. You'll hear from another one later, but uh, Erik Christoffersen has done several tours in Afghanistan. Uh, he has received uh, Norway's highest, Norway's highest decoration, decoration for valor, and he has commanded the special forces. So when he took over the home guard of the Heimavan at last November, a journalist asked him whether this wasn't a, a terrible career move. And the journalist said, well, how can you go from the special forces to the to the Heimavan, uh, isn't that a, a, a step down? And, and he said, no, it's, it's not a bad career move at all. I've got the largest number of soldiers in the Norwegian Armed Forces, and he does. Uh, nearly eight in 10 Norwegian soldiers belong to Heimavan. And as you saw in the video, uh, it's no dad's army, by the way. Happy 50th birthday, dad's army. Um, and the Himavan is an important job under any circumstances, but I would submit that it's especially important now because homeland defense is back on the agenda. Now, I said soldiers, but uh, Himavan members are primarily uh, volunteers who are simply compensated for their time. And they, as, as uh, Eric Christofferson said in the video, they spend a lot of their time doing things like search and rescue and, ev and evacuations. And in fact, a couple of months ago, uh, there was a situation like that where a mountain was blocked by a huge ice block so the residents couldn't get up or down. Well, what do you do in such a situation? Who, who's supposed to get the ice block down? Well, the Heimvernet, local Heimvernet unit was called in and, and they positioned themselves on, on the next mountain and shot the ice block down from there. Uh, quick and easy and, uh, and done locally. Now, uh, I'm not Norwegian so I can say this, but Norway is a wealthy country. And it could afford uh, more uh, professional active duty soldiers and officers. But I would suggest that having these 40,000, this for Norway huge number of Heimavernet members is a good arrangement. And it's a good arrangement not just for practical reasons, but because national security involves everybody. And that's what I want to talk about. And I want to talk about it because, as, as, as you all know, and as uh, Mark has just outlined, the threats to our societies are changing and becoming more diverse. And as a result, we need people in addition to the professional armed forces, which is to say that we need the rest of us. Now, 90% of, of uh, General Christofferson's members, him and members, are assigned to units in their local area. And that means that on a day-to-day -day -day basis, even when they're just going about their, their, their jobs or in daily lives, they can keep a trained eye on things and report anything unusual. And of course, when something happens, they are never far away. And in Denmark, uh, the Hjemmevern, it's the same name again, uh, does uh, much the same thing, and including lots of crowd control and guarding of crime scenes. And for example, earlier this year, I, I read the local Danish news, uh, a, a local Heimavernet unit uh, took turns to guard or watch a bridge 
from which somebody had been throwing rocks at the cars below. And that's something the police doesn't have the resources to do. And it shouldn't be necessary for the police or any other uh, active service to do it either because we citizen, uh, citizens, uh, ordinary citizens can step up and do our part. Now last year, Hjemmeval member spent 2.4 million hours on assignments and in training, and that included 140,000 hours spent assisting the police, which just illustrates again that ordinary citizens are a resource to society. Because our societies don't need police officers to watch a bridge, or soldiers, there they are, soldiers piling sandbags, the, the rest of us could help with that. And in fact, uh, the rest of us could even help guard uh, Olympic Games in, if we were to do it in an organized fashion. And that's especially true now because of the combination of increasing threats and lean, uh, lean armed forces. And so I would submit that it's a waste. I mean, these soldiers are doing a great job here, but it's a waste to have, have, to have them do it alone uh, when there are lots of local residents who could be trained to assist them. Now, I recently watched a, a documentary about, uh, does anybody remember Whiskey on the Rocks? All right. I recently watched a documentary about Whiskey on the Rocks, uh, the, the 1981 submarine incident, and the journalist asked the Navy commander in charge of the local area whether it was embarrassing that the Navy had been first spotted by a local resident rather than by the armed forces. And the commander said, no, it's not embarrassing at all because the armed forces can't be everywhere all the time. We need citizens to be alert. And that's exactly what it's about. Total defense that includes all parts of society, especially alert and engaged and trained citizens. And total defense, I would submit, is making a comeback because here on the home front we, do, we, we need to do a lot more than simply spotting submarines that may have run aground or criminals that are throwing rocks from bridges. Or maybe I should say it's about to make a comeback. And I saw a number of Swedish officers here earlier. Well, the total defense is making a comeback in Sweden in particular. And you've probably read about or heard or seen uh, the new brochure that was sent out by the Swedish Con Civil Contingencies Agency to all the households in the country. Uh, it's called If the War or Crisis Comes and outlines in very easy bullet points what uh, residents of Sweden should do in any particular, any and every particular crisis situation. And uh, in addition to that, there is an all-parliamentary commission that recently finished a report that recommended that Sweden will have to uh, fend for itself or survive uh, without any outside assistance for three months. Well, that includes citizens doing that or residents doing that part. And specifically, it includes the exp expectation that citizens should be able to, or residents should be able to fend for themselves for seven days. Uh, and the, recommend, uh, this, uh, the report further recommends that staff in all levels of government should be assigned to total defense roles and that the government should introduce strategic food reserves. There will also be a new government agency for psychological defense, which links to some of what Sir Mark outlined earlier about the disinformation campaigns. And I would argue that se such steps are important because we are the homeland with our open societies are the soft underbelly of national defense. And I was thinking about that in connection with uh, hacks on the power grid, for example. And such hacks, as, as you all know, can have extremely severe effects. And uh, Lloyd's Insurance recently commissioned a study that looked at a potential hack of the power grid that covers the 15 northeastern United States. And Lloyd's calculator, it would leave, that it would leave 100 million people without power for 24 hours or more. And so we can't have 100 million civilians running around trying to fix uh, the, the, uh, the aftermath of a, of a massive power outage. But with some degree of instruction and, in training, and training, they can provide assistance to uniformed personnel. And uh, as Sir Mark said just now, we shouldn't become over-reliant on the army. Which brings us back to Christofferson and Heimewernet. 
Now, in case of an attack of any kind on Norway, as he said, these men and women are a reliable bunch of, of citizen, uh, trained citizens. And as you saw, I, I know you will say that, that wouldn't work here because they wear uniforms, they carry weapons, and, and you will say, well, the UK public just doesn't support having soldiers or, or armed uh, military personnel around the streets. But uh, I would argue that uh, such a system is possible in this country, even if it's not set up like, like the Norwegian or, or any other Scandinavian system. Um, for example, we could have, it wouldn't even have to, uh, so they could wear different uniforms that, uh, that uh, um, didn't, I, that didn't look like, like anything like military uniforms. And we could even have a completely different system where we didn't have um, uh, armed home guards, but instead something like a, a resilience force. Uh, and f instead of uh, conscription, which would never fly in this country, I know, we could have resilience training for teenagers, for example, between year 12 and 13. <coughs> and where they would gain a resilience certificate at the end, which would be useful on their university applications and, uh, in fact, on their um, very minimal CVs. And uh, residents could uh, then, uh, graduates of the resilience scheme could keep their resilience certificate current by um, uh, attending refresher training. And that could be incentivized through tax breaks. So you don't have to volunteer like this, uh, uh, like the men and, and uh, women in Eric Christofferson's um, force. And what's more, now Sir Mark just outlined uh, the continuing terrorist threats that will remain and the risk of a pandemic flu. So it doesn't really matter whether any country will have, is, has an, uh, any imminent plans to attack this country because resilience training is beneficial to society because of all these other threats uh, and that uh, would benefit from civilians with, with some training even though it's not as, as, uh, um, as much expertise as you all have. And by the way, that includes training in how to detect and uh, react to disinformation campaigns. And so I think the point is not that we need a more militaristic society, uh, because I would argue we don't, but we need citizens as a resource when it comes to less complex security threats. And if I may just uh, mention the example of San Francisco. Uh, now, it has something very similar to the Swedish Total Defense Plan, uh, and it relates to earthquakes. So the city runs constant inform information campaigns telling uh, residents what to do, how to prepare. And so I know uh, sushi is, is uh, no good. You should store uh, canned tuna and water. And, um, and as a result, uh, the, the threat of an earthquake in San Francisco, yeah, I mean, it would be a terrible thing if there were an earthquake, but it wouldn't be uh, catastrophic because residents know exactly what to do. They have stored the right items. They know where to hide while the earthquake is happening. They know what to do afterwards. And it's worth remembering, I think, that that sort of instruction and, and training makes you less frightened of, of, a, of a particular uh, crisis or danger scenario uh, because it makes you confident in your own abilities to fend for yourself and for your fellow, uh, fellow residents. And if I could just add that uh, prepared citizens add to the deterrence and that way, ordinary citizens go from being a burden on society and on, on you all to being an asset. And um, when thinking about this, I, I thought about um, John Lennon. Now, I don't know how many times John Lennon has been mentioned at the, the Land Warfare Conference, but it occurred to me that uh, one of his songs needs to be updated, and it needs to be updated as follows. Uh, imagine all the people, and then, Here's the update. Knowing what to do, parenthesis, in a war or a crisis. Then the people out here on, on Victoria Street in Great Smith Street and on, on every street in this country would become part of the deterrent. Thank you very much. <laughs>